Good afternoon and welcome to our April webinar, a collaborative presentation of the Federation for Children with Special Needs and the Recruitment Training and Support Center. My name is Janie Krekko and I am the Training and Support Specialist at RTSC. Our technical producers today are Renee Williams and Danny Harden. Today's webinar is a rebroadcast of Restorative Justice, The Fundamentals, presented by Nan Starr. Nan is a mediator and a restorative justice advocate and practitioner in southeastern Massachusetts. Her restorative justice work has been primarily focused on restorative practice initiatives in underperforming schools and the juvenile court in New Bedford, Massachusetts. She has a Master of Science in Mediation and Applied Conflict Studies from the Woodbury Institute at Champlain College and a BFA from Tufts University, Boston School of the Museum of Fine Arts. Nan is a newly minted SESP and a member of the famous Mighty Uketones in New Bedford. If you are interested in learning more about the Federation, please go to our website at www.fcsn.org and explore all the different programs, including how to volunteer to become a special education surrogate parent or attend one of our many trainings presented by the Parent Training Information Center. Once again, Nan, welcome. Thank you, Janie. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. Um, I'm happy, always happy, to share information um, about restorative justice and specifically restorative practices in schools. Because we only have an hour, it won't be a very deep dive, but I'm hoping you'll be able to come away with a fundamental understanding about what restorative justice is, how it might be helpful in the special ed context, and why it's more important now than ever. Um, it, it, over your presentation, we'll, we'll talk about briefly about the historical context uh, of restorative justice, what restorative justice is, and equally importantly, what it isn't, um, the core values, principles, and goals of restorative justice, circles, restorative conferences, some reasons why this works and um, where it's happening, also some challenges in the field. Um, and we'll consider ways restorative practices in schools can help promote equity and achievement for students with disabilities. So, uh, the million dollar question, what is restorative justice? And I get asked that all, every day, um, still, less now than I used to. Um, I wrote a master's paper on juvenile restorative justice almost 10 years ago because I'd heard and read some really compelling information about restorative justice. And like a lot of people, I wanted to fit it into a neat container of some sort, easily classifiable, in order to understand it. I set out with the intention of categorizing all of the different models and practices that I had heard of, of restorative justice. And it became evident to me really quickly that restorative justice practices are fundamentally immune from strict categorization. And contrary to my assumptions, restorative justice is not actually a process at all, but a set of values and principles. The models and methods that arise from those principles are idiosyncratic to the needs, values, and culture of the community they are serving. They are fluid and they are adaptable. They stand alone and they strengthen each other. You could ask 10 different restorative justice practitioners to define restorative justice and you'd get 10 different answers, related but distinct. Um, they are all derivative um, with the same emphases. This is mine. Um, restorative justice is a social justice framework based on a set of principles and practices that move us away from punitive responses to wrongdoing towards restoration of the emotional, material, and re relational, most importantly, relational losses resulting from the harm caused. Rather than seeing violations of rules and laws as an affront on the abstract power of authorities, Restorative justice redefines our understanding of wrongdoing as harm against individuals and communities. Those who have been responsible for or impacted by the harm are in the best position to collectively identify how to repair it. Um, restorative justice isn't new, it, um, even though it still may be unfamiliar to a lot of folks. The foundation of restorative justice is based on ancient values and practices that have been at the core of indigenous justice traditions worldwide for centuries. Native American and First Nation justice philosophies are grounded in the belief that when harm occurs, 
healing the harm, and then reintegrating the person responsible for causing the harm back into the community is more important and much more effective than punishment. There's also an understanding that when one person in our community has failed, on some level we have all failed, which means it's up to all of us to figure out how to make things right. Um, the modern restorative justice movement began almost 40 years ago with victim offender mediation and reconciliation work in Minnesota and Indiana. It got good early traction in several juvenile justice systems around the country, including Maryland, Vermont, Minnesota, Colorado, and California. It is gaining momentum nationwide right now, especially in our school systems. Global pioneers, including um, Canada, the UK, and most notably New Zealand, um, where all juvenile justice cases have been referred to RJ for over 25 years, and also Australia credited for, or should all be credited for pioneering the use of restorative justice in schools. Important to understanding what restorative justice is, it's important to understand what it isn't. Some common misconceptions about restorative justice um, are listed here, uh, and this is really important to look at and think about. Um, Restorative justice is not a quick fix. Restorative justice practices are only as strong as the foundation they sit on, and that foundation takes time to build. It's not soft on crime or easy on offenders. We are all familiar with the discomfort and resistance to facing those we've harmed, and people sitting face to face with those they've harmed in a restorative process are no exception. It's not unheard of for juvenile offenders in underserved or low-income communities facing criminal charges to choose lockup over facing their victims. It is not all about forgiveness. While some victims choose to forgive, it should never be an expectation or goal. This is the problem with some programs that use default apology letters as part of the agreement. Um, it's not one size fits all, prepackaged, easily transferable, solution. It's, uh, it must be grown organically from the ground up of the community it's serving. It's not appropriate for every crime or every person if a victim wishes to proceed through a court process that is his or her right. It's not one specific process, method, or program to be imposed on schools or courts. Um, for teachers who are already suffering from initiative fatigue, it's important to understand that restorative justice can work hand in hand with other effective programs contributing to the collective goal of building a healthy school climate. In other words, restorative justice equals values, philosophy, and principles first, methodology, processes, and models second. Uh, back to my own personal journey to understand what restorative justice is, I, it took reading this quote from Howard Zare, who's largely recognized as the grandfather of the modern restorative justice movement, to finally really get it. Restorative justice is a compass, it's not a map, as much as we would like it to be. Um, restorative values endorsed by the United Nations, the American Bar Association, and many religious organizations stress healing over punishment, reconciliation over anger, and reintegration over rejection. The core assumptions um, of, at work with restorative justice are that healthy communities, families, and schools depend on the care and connection of their members. In order for people to feel they are in healthy relationship to others, they need to feel respected and valued in a way that validates their individual worth and dignity. So how does RJ help students with special needs? Um, I am, I'm new to special needs, I, but I, I, it's a natural fit um, when you think about the core goals. The inherently inclusive, respectful, and collaborative nature of restorative justice works towards developing the empathy that is needed for all involved. Restorative justice gives voice to and validates the experience and needs of everyone in the community family, or classroom, particularly those who've been marginalized, oppressed, and or harmed. 
Restorative justice asks us to act and respond in ways that are respectful and healing rather than coercive and alienating. It gives room to get to the root causes of behavior problems rather than just dealing with the symptoms. So who uses restorative justice? Um, I think any, anybody can use restorative justice. Um, the principles and practices can be seen most widely in these contexts, the juvenile justice system or the justice system, um, schools, communities, families, organizations, and faith communities. Um, the essential difference between our traditional retributive systems and restorative justice can be seen in these core questions. And if you come away from this with nothing else but an understanding of these core questions, I think that um, you'll be able to describe to other people what it is. Traditional retributive justice asks these questions. What laws or rules have been broken? Who broke them? What punishment do they deserve? And that's familiar to all of us because that's kind of the way we operate. Restorative justice asks a different set of questions. What harm has been done and to whom? What needs to be done to repair the harm? And who is responsible for that repair? Um, retributive justice uh, sees things through a different lens than restorative justice. Retributive justice sees wrongdoing as a violation of the school rules or the law, whereas restorative justice sees wrongdoing as an offense on relationships and people. On, in retributive justice, the focus is on establishing guilt, which keeps everybody in the past. And in restorative justice, the focus is on needs and responsibilities moving people towards the future. Um, with retributive justice, accountability equals punishment. And with restorative justice, accountability equals understanding the impact and repairing the harm. Uh, retributive justice focuses mostly on the offender, and the victim is largely ignored and feels invisible. With restorative justice, the victim, offender, and community are all involved in righting the wrong. With retributive justice, stigma of an incident can be permanent for the offender and, and can be for the victim as well. Um, in restorative justice, stigma is mitigated by reintegration of all involved back into the community. With retributive justice, there's no opportunity for remorse or amends, um, or no real genuine opportunity. And with restorative justice, um, making room for genuine remorse and holding um, holds making amends as a, as a core principle. So restorative justice in schools is generally referred to by most people, but not everybody, as restorative practices and are increasingly being embraced by individual schools and school districts around the country. This is especially true in the last few years with increased need to address youth behavior, rule infractions, and to improve overall school climate. Um, restorative practices are processes that proactively build healthy relationships and a sense of community to prevent and address conflict and wrongdoing. Um, when implemented well, restorative practices do not represent one particular program, as I've said, um, and they do not have to compete with other programs like PBIS, SEL, which can actually complement restorative practices, but those are standalone pro programs which restorative justice is not, even though it's hard for people to actually um, wrap their head around that. Um, so it's more of a framework and a mindset that gets embedded into the fabric of the school community. When restorative attitudes and strategies are an integral part of the school culture, issues that come up can be addressed quickly and more effectively because the foundational support and sense of connection in the community is already in place. Um, restorative practices can be used for any number of things. Um, in my graphic here, um, I've broken it down this way. It can be used for building positive school climate based on healthy relationships. It can be used for restorative or for uh, classroom management by reducing harmful behavior. It can be used to support marginalized students by addressing individual needs and ensuring fair process, which I'll come back to. Um, it can be used for developing social emotional literacy which comes from learning to listen 
well and developing empathy. And restorative practice can be used as an alternative discipline and conflict resolution tool um, and as a way to reintegrate students back into the community. The primary restorative practices in schools, um, it can take many different forms. Um, I have four listed here, but it can be a teacher speaking respectfully instead of yelling in frustration at a misbehaving student. Um, that is exercising a restorative mindset. These are the four most util utilized restorative practices that fall loosely into categories, but again, it's all loose. Circles, restorative conferencing, restorative dialogue, and school community building circles. Uh, most of you are probably familiar in this in this community. You're probably familiar with the multi-tiered system of support, the MTSS pyramid that came out of the public health world and is now used in educational settings. First with literacy, then math, and now with behavior. When you overlay the different restorative processes onto the three-tiered pyramid, it looks kind of like this. Um, you can see that the green bottom third of the pyramid is essential to holding up the rest of the pyramid. This is where the proactive and preventative community building gets done, which is critical. Without that foundation, the restorative and reintegrative work that gets done up top in the red section is likely to topple. One problem in the field has been the urgency of need to deal with dis disruptive and destructive behaviors in some schools, especially in lower income urban schools. And that has led sometimes to the implementation of the top tier before the bottom foundation has been laid. And it is not as sustainable as taking the longer view and starting from the proactive preventative practices. Um, why are circles, which you'll hear a lot about um, in the restorative justice context, um, such an important, powerful tool for building a healthy school climate? As Carolyn Boyce Watson and Kay Pranis say in their book, Circle Forward, Building Restorative School Community, which I highly recommend anybody get their hands on, um, there's reference to it at the end of this um, webinar, so there you can find out how, to, how you can get it. Um, according to Carolyn, and K, schools are intense, dynamic communities, continuously working on how participants are going to be together, which impacts all aspects of the success of a school. The circle is a highly structured, intentional space designed to promote connection, understanding, and dialogue in a group. The circle is a powerful tool for that basic community function of working out how we are going to be together which includes building relationships, establishing norms, and working through our differences. The circle fulfills this basic community function. It's, it holds a healthy balance between individual needs and group needs. When we are using circle as a regular practice in our community, we are not just building relationships or solving conflicts. We are practice, practicing basic ways of being that are fundamental to being successful together. Restorative circles can be likened to campfires where we share equally in the warmth, quality, safety, trust, and transparency. You can see everyone's face. Um, you can see everything that's going on in the circle. You can share in the responsibility of what is being said or sung. No one can hide. Recently, um, I, I heard uh, John English, who is an education specialist at the Oregon Department of Education, punctuate this analogy by telling us to imagine sitting around a campfire in rows. <laughs> um, types of circles are, um, are, are limitless, but most circles fall loosely into these four categories. Community building circles in the green on the tier chart um, are proactive, relationship building, and essential. Students know they can count on them. Check-in and check-out circles allow teachers and students to get a pulse, express needs, and show support of each other. They can also be a good time. They can also be a good time to share information, um, news, good jokes, whatever. Um, responsive circles, which are in the yellow part and the red part of the tier chart, 
are reactive circles, and they are incident-based. Not always as formal as a restorative conference, which is in the red tier, but these are used when something specific has happened and harm has occurred. Reentry circles happen when someone has been removed from the community, for example, during a suspension, and is returning. Schools can hold staff meetings and parent-teacher conferences in circle. Um, addressing this audience's needs directly, I don't see any reason why IEP meetings shouldn't be done in circle. It would help keep the focus on collaborating uh, in the child's best interest. Family engagement can be positively impacted using restorative circles, uh, especially with historically marginalized parents who generally don't have opportunities for authentic conversations with teachers and school administrators in positions of power. Um, it allows for genuine relationships to be built and for parents to feel supported and connected. And as we know, improved communication between parents and teachers has a ripple down effect as measured by positive student, student engagement. Um, values and goals of circles, this again, not an exhaustive list, but some key circle value, values and goals are, um, first and foremost, circles give voice to all participants and, there can, and thereby can be a great power equalizer. Um, Carolyn and Kay speak to the paradox of power and circle forward saying basically that if students feel the power and authority of the adults around them is legitimate and fair, they will respect that power. When they feel it is unjustified, they will resent and resist it. The paradox is that in order for authority to be seen as legitimate, it is necessary for individuals to feel that their own personal power is still respected by those in authority. Um, it highlights interdependence, interconnectedness, works towards cooperation, collaboration, and consensus. What affects any of us affects all of us. Circle participants are invited to speak from the heart. Compassion and empathy are developed for the other. And no one sits outside of the circle. I have a story, but let me just check the time here. Um, uh, I had a principal at an at a, um, alternative school in the South Coast. Um, and he was very supportive of our work, but felt way too busy to participate in the training that we were doing. On the second day of the training, he slipped into the room and thought he could stand in the corner to observe. Um, I, I invited him to join us uh, using the teaching moment to explain this particular value of no one sitting outside of the circle. And by doing so, he had the opportunity to experience firsthand the magic of circle. He witnessed and participated in a fleeting but palpable relationship transformation between teachers and students as they both began to let down their guards and allow for a certain vulnerability. Um, in other words, the circle gave permission and access to understand each other's humanity. And he was blown away by sitting in the circle for 15 minutes. Um, when it works well, it is magical. Primary goals of RJ are to build community within the classroom, or whatever the context is, to address difficult um, issues and conflicts, and as an academic tool. Um, Beverly Title uh, has a great quote about um, restorative uh, uh, practices and circles. Um, She's a teacher, youth advocate, and restorative justice pioneer in Colorado. And she's famous for her five R's, which are relationship, responsibility, respect, repair, and reintegration. You can Google five R's and you will find this document. Um, she felt that respect was the container for all restorative practices. Her quote, uh, everybody matters, every action ripples, and everyone has a gift. And it is our responsibility to help others bring their own gift to the world while we do the same. So circus, circle um, process elements include um, circling up in chairs or on the floor with no table or other furniture to um, hide behind. This allows for a vulnerability, which is key to developing empathy. Um, a circle keeper who facilitates the circle can be, in the context of a school, can be a teacher, can 
it's great when that starts to become the students. Um, group guidelines, which are developed, asking this question, what do we each need to feel safe and respected in this circle? Again, better to have the group develop them than to have somebody come in and impose them. Um, the talking piece, which can actually be anything that has meaning to the group, at, traditionally with indigenous cultures it was a feather often. Um, I use an apple sometimes, or a stone. Um, it does not have to be used all the time. Some practitioners choose not to use it in certain contexts, but it's an important traditional element, element to help circle participants listen more deeply while waiting their turn to speak. Participants are always free to pass, um, but what I have found is that as the circle goes along, even the people who are initially starting to pass get feeling more comfortable and engage in a way that they may not actually have ever been able to feel safe enough to do before. Um, restorative conferencing, which it, um, you'll see in the red tier if you look at, back at the pyramid, is reactive rather than proactive. Um, and it's a response to incident-based harm. It seeks to identify, repair, and prevent harm by providing a safe space for those involved to better understand what happened and to come up with a plan to make things right. The person who caused harm uh, must come into the conference having already taken responsibility. Uh, they get a chance to speak about what happened from their perspective and why, but this is not meant to be a fact-finding mission. Harmed parties have the opportunity to say how they were impacted by the harm caused, allowing responsi uh, responsible parties to understand cause and effect in a way that they often have not considered. By bringing vulnerability to the table, so to speak, empathy has a chance to grow. Other conference participants can include support friends, family uh, members, teachers, and other meaningful adults. Uh, rather than taking a passive role, as happens with suspension, as we all know, expulsion and incarceration, offending students are held accountable and required to take an active role in repairing the harm. The group works together towards understanding the harm cause and to come to an agreement on the best way to repair and heal from that harm. Two essential values of all restorative justice processes are that participation is voluntary and that the process is confidential. Confidentiality can obviously be hard to control in schools, but this is a key, is a key to allowing for the expression of stronger emotions and uh, difficult topics. The confidentiality piece can also be tricky in a world where school conduct sometimes interfaces with the law, and this is an area that um, I'm not going to have time to go into right now, but is of concern in, in schools uh, um, around mandated reporting uh, responsibilities. Um, and um, th this is being addressed by professionals in the field, um, and hopefully maybe as a follow-up uh, webinar we'll be able to go more deeply into that. I see that the, public, um, the Boston Public Schools Code of Conduct has addressed this by spelling out, procedures shall be implemented such that information disclosed in the course of these restorative practices shall not be used against the student should the practice break down and the case be later referred to law enforcement. It's important that all school systems implementing restorative practices make sure to include language like this when they are updating their code of conduct. Um, restorative questions. Uh, RJ facilitators, implementers, and trainers all use some version of the universally accepted restorative questions. These simple but effective questions ask everyone involved to help facilitate the restorative process leading to clearer expression of what happened and how people were affected. Genuine understanding and remorse and often transformation. So questions, um, I've broken it down into three different sort of um, categories of questions uh, as other practitioners have. Questions for telling the story of the incident and again it's, it's not in order to go on a fact-finding mission. It's, it's for everybody to get a chance to speak their truth. So the question is what happened? Um, what were you feeling or thinking at the time, or if you were um, a bystander or when you heard about it? Um, what have you thought about since? Second group of questions uh, are for exploring the impact of the incident. How has this affected you? Who else do you think has been affected and in what way? 
what has been the hardest part of this for you and for your family and your friends? Um, what concerns you most about this? And this is where, you know, people start to see each other as, as human beings. Um, often people go into restorative uh, processes, especially the ones in, that are sort of criminally based with, um, you know, the, the offender being seen as sort of a monster in the eyes of the victims. And this can really shake that understanding up um, and open the door to a whole different way of thinking about it. Um, so questions for repairing the harm and making agreements. Uh, what do you think needs to happen to make things right? What needs to be done to prevent this from happening again? Uh, what is each of you able to commit to in order to move on from this? What should the agreement or the plan look like? And uh, does everyone agree to this plan? Once the shift happens um, of, of seeing each other as human beings, these, this final set of questions um, helps everyone work collaboratively. And it seems to happen pretty fluidly in my experience once you get past um, see this the last set of questions where people get a chance to actually show who they are and what what they are how this has impacted them um, restorative discipline um, is used for any number of things that it, it's important to talk at this point about the use of the word discipline in our culture because it's evolved to mean or to equate with punishment uh, but the Latin root of the word discipline actually means um, teaching and learning, not punishing. So theoretically, if I'm going to discipline you, I have an obligation to teach you something. Restorative discipline can be used in any number of contexts, including um, bullying, truancy, fighting, academic integrity breaches, and any number of other problem behaviors that happen. Uh, I think it's especially helpful with, with bullying. Um, because victims, people who've been harmed, are able to um, allow their voice in a way that there is really no other context to um, to uh, allow. Um, so key goals of restorative discipline um, to create a caring climate for support to support safe, healthy communities, to listen and respond to the needs of the people who have been harmed as well as the person responsible for the harm, to understand the harm and develop empathy for all involved, to encourage accountability and responsibility through personal reflection with a collaborative planning process, to reintegrate the responsible party and, if necessary, the harmed party back into the community as valuable contributing members. And I say, you know, if necessary, because sometimes the victim actually finds themselves being um, as as cast off as the um, as the offender. Um, some theories behind why restorative justice works: um, fair process, social discipline theory, and reintegrative shaming. Um, I'll talk very briefly about these, but they are important because they're at the core of of the work. Uh, the three keys to fair process include engagement meaning involving individuals in decisions that affect them by listening to their views and genuinely taking their opinions into account. Explanation, meaning explaining the reasons behind a decision to everyone who has been involved or who's affected. And expectation clarity, meaning making sure that everyone clearly understands a decision and what is expected of them in the future. Um, this is a great little um, illustration of fair process that some of you are probably seeing. Take a look at it. Um, I have a note here to myself that says more like fair selection process than fair process, <laughs> but, um, but it's a great little um, illustration. Um, this social discipline model, and this is a, again, you're going to have to take a closer look at this on your own, but it's a very important piece to why restorative practices work. This is an ad adapted. Um, graphic, I combined a couple different people's work into this um, practice, but or into this graphic, but there's some, the core quadrants of doing to, doing nothing, doing for, and doing with are um, what you have to understand in order to understand why um, restorative justice works. With control and limit setting on one axis and nurture support on the other, these four quadrants represent four ways our actions as teachers and parents impact our young people. 
While we all know teachers and parents, ourselves included at times, who sometimes fall in autopilot into authoritarian, which is doing two, excuse making, which is doing four, or uninvolved, which is doing nothing. Um, in the short run, these may be quicker, easier responses to, disciplinary, to disciplining and teaching children. Um, restorative practices are effective because they land us squarely in the upper right authoritative quadrant, which is doing with. This is authoritative, not authoritarian. It's important to understand the distinction. Um, it balances expectations with support um, and is sort of akin to the idea of you know teaching a village to fish rather than giving the village the fish, um, which would be doing for. Um, when we do with, we build pro-attunement, pro-social attunement, connection, accountability, and competency. Okay, um, the last theory I'm going to talk about is reintegrative shame, shaming, and um, this is a really critical theory, and, and I understand the word shaming is hard for some people to see any value in, and I, I get that. Um, but we have to sort of rethink what we mean when we are talking about shaming. As John Braithwaite says in describing his critical theory of uh, reintegrative shaming, it, reintegrative shaming communicates disapproval of behavior within a continuum of respect for the offender. The offender is treated as a good person who has done a bad deed. Shaming, as we tend to think about it, is disrespectful and stigmatizing. An offender is treated as a bad person and the stigma is unforgiving and permanent. Whereas reintegrative shaming is forgiving. It's shaming um, offenders or um, um, sh showing them your disapproval of their actions just enough for them to understand the impact of their actions. But always with the understanding that they will be reintegrated back into the community um, that they are a member of. Societies that are forgiving and respectful while taking crime seriously have low crime rates. Societies that degrade and humiliate people, as we sometimes do in this country and in our justice systems and in our school systems, have higher crime rates. The shaming process is at the heart of RJ, this kind of shaming, <laughs> integrative shaming. Um, compared to um, Compared to negative shaming, it leads to reconciliation with and reacceptance of the wrongdoer um, and attempts to reintegrate the offender back into the community rather than isolating the perpetrator from the community. Or as Braithwaite himself says, tolerance of crime makes things worse. The stigmatization or disrespectful outcasting shame of crimes makes things worse still. Disapproval within a continuum of respect for the offender terminated, that's a key word, by rituals of forgiveness makes things better. Young people have the right to be given an opportunity to learn from their mistakes. The most effective way to do that is for them to hear firsthand from those most affected. When empathy develops, behaviors can change. We all know um, that zero tolerance policies have led to an overuse of suspension, expulsion, and police involvement in schools. Uh, and this has led to further alienation and apathy of some students, particularly certain uh, vulnerable subgroups. The school to prison pipeline is um, a pretty common concept to most of us. And we usually talk about it through the critically urgent race, race and ethnic lens. There are other vulnerable subgroups, including students with disabilities, that we need to make sure are also protected. Recognizing that zero tolerance policies have failed, restorative practices are rapidly and successfully replacing them nationwide. So how um, can restorative practices positively impact students with disabilities? Uh, restorative practices teach social skills um, in mainstream and pull-out classes. Students get to practice empathy, which is important on many levels. Restorative practices feel safer for kids with um, complex trauma and won't tr trigger that fight or flight response the way negative interventions can. Restorative practices addresses harm around bullying more effectively. Um, and as I've said, I think that circles can be used for IEP meetings. Might take some convincing, but um, I think it's worth, worth 
tr trying. And circles can be a good place for parents and guardians of children with special needs to, to, to talk, reflect, heal, support each other. Um, as I suggested earlier, restorative practices can counteract the disparate impact of disciplinary exclusion from school on vulnerable subgroups based on race, ethnicity, gender, disability status, LGBTQ, et cetera. Um, so where is this working? Uh, there's a list of schools here um, which are sort of early pioneers. Things are really getting good traction in Baltimore, Boston, Chicago, Cleveland, Denver, Madison, Minneapolis, New Orleans, New York City, Oakland, among other cities. Um, in 2012, Colorado passed the Fair Discipline in Schools Act, one of the most far-reaching state school discipline reform laws, putting Colorado at the forefront of the movement to end zero tolerance. RJ is central to the law requiring schools to use prevention, intervention, restorative justice, peer mediation, counseling, and other approaches to address student misconduct. Um, the Oakland uh, Unified School System has really um, figured out how to implement this district-wide uh, in a way that's impressive and worth um, looking closely at. Um, they've been at the forefront of these practices. And um, they began the whole school restorative justice movement. And you note it's whole school, meaning not just sort of the disciplinary office or the fourth grade teacher because she likes it, but the whole school. Um, with one school in 2005. By 2013, 2014, 24 schools had implemented um, restorative practices, and I think that that number has grown fairly significantly in the last two years. 80% of staff at participating schools um, endorsed the continued use of restorative justice practices, and data shows that improvements were made in absenteeism, uh, especially in middle school, graduation rates, reduced referrals for disruptive behavior, et cetera. Um, students in restorative justice circles report the development of great, greater empathy. This is reported out by the students themselves, enhancing their ability to understand peers, manage emotions, and maintain positive relationships in school, as well as more effectively resolving conflict with their parents at home, which contributes to improved home environment. They are learning life skills and sustainable conflict uh, management skills that will stick with them. Um, there's a lot of data just out uh, from Oakland, and it, this is a great news to the field because there hasn't been a lot of data. I don't have time. There are a few slides here I don't have time to, um, to go into, but you can see that the participation in restorative justice um, has considerably reduced suspension among RJ schools compared to non-RJ schools, and um, it has also, you can see if you read this, um, you know, improved relationships between students and teachers contributing to a healthy overall school climate. We can also see that restorative practices has reduced office referrals, um, suspensions, and expulsions, as I said, with the greatest decline seen in suspensions and expulsions for students with color, and you can see that or students of color, you can see that um, in this next slide, the next two slides. So read those, you'll see um, uh, how successful Oakland has been with this. Um, there's some other data here from the Youth Transformation Center um, that people will ask you if you're trying to push this, what, yet, what do you have for data? This is um, some data that's been around for a while. This is actually older data. Um, recidivism rates have dropped to 30% using a uh, conventional punitive system, oh sorry, have dropped from 30% um, using conventional punitive systems to 8% using restorative practices. Um, and you can read more about that. Boston, closer to home, Boston Public Schools Code of Conduct, which was just um, revised in 2016, encourages restorative practices. Key relevant language in Chapter 2 Two, two, which addresses exclusion, includes um, limiting the use of long-term suspension and, con and uh, as a consequence for student misconduct until other consequences have been considered and tried. To promote engagement of a student's parent in discussion of a student's misconduct and options for responding to it, and to keep schools safe and supportive for all students while ensuring fair and effective practices. 
15 to 20 schools in the Boston public school system have implemented some restorative practices, and that is increasing exponentially. There's a newly designated deputy superintendent for social emotional learning, which is very exciting. There's pressure from city council, as well as a restorative justice organizing committee working in partnership with Boston Teachers Union to increase implementation. If you're interest, interested in knowing more about these uh, Boston initiatives, a good place to start is at the Institute for Restorative Schools, which is based at the Center for Restorative Justice at Suffolk University, and the information for that is on this slide. Um, there's some legislation um, that is underway in Massachusetts. Um, the goal of the bills, it's in the House and the Senate, um, the goal of the bills uh, is to enable restorative justice referrals throughout the criminal justice system, um, including those referred by, by school resource officers. So it, it does have to do with schools. It's not about embedding restorative practices in schools per se, although that could be next. Um, and you can read about these. This, uh, these Actually, the bill numbers have changed since I wrote this, since I put, put this slide together. Um, and I am happy to answer anyone's questions about, about that. Um, or you can actually contact the Massachusetts Restorative Justice Coalition, um, and there's information about that on the bottom of this slide. Um, so some of the challenges, I've touched on most of these challenges already in the field, um, and this list isn't an, it, exhaustive, but looking at them all here in one place, we can see that they aren't insurmountable either. In my experience, the biggest challenges have been around the tendency to implement uh, restorative discipline, as I talked about, without laying the foundation. Um, and that's because the, er, the need is so strong right now, um, and teachers are looking for tools. Um, implementation design for whole school change can sometimes get overlooked uh, uh, when trying to put out fires quickly. Another challenge has been um, some, you know, perception of it, sort of initiative fatigue for teachers and that this is one more initiative that teachers don't have the time, the schools don't have the money to implement, and uh, it has to be understood that it isn't just another in packaged initiative. It's a whole way of changing the way we behave with each other and build relationships. Um, ambiguous and inconsistent dis discipline policies for serious school offenses um, has been a, a challenge. Uh, restorative justice is, is not just another program to be imposed on schools. It's, it does not push out current initiatives. Restorative practices working independently or alongside promising programs can collectively provide tools to rethink and then build a caring culture in a school. Um, oopsie. Sorry about that. Um, a couple quotes to end with. Um, these three quotes, and there's so many great quotes around uh, that sort of address why this is important, um, but I have found these three to be the most compelling for me. Um, Judge Leslie Harris, it, within restorative justice in the court context, in the um, justice context, has said, every time we arrest a child, we change their life forever. Every time we arraign a child, we've left a footprint that can't be erased. We know children have issues. And those issues should be dealt with in the community, not in the court. And that's coming from a judge. Um, children, let's see, uh, Brene Brown, who some of you may know, um, believes we are all wired to love, to be loved, and to belong. And she says, a deep sense of love and belonging is an irreducible need for all people. We are biologically cognitively, physically, and spiritually wired to love, to be loved, and to belong. When these needs are not met, we don't function as we are meant to. We break. We fall apart. We numb. We ache. We hurt others. We get sick. Um, as a colleague uh, of mine who is doing a lot of good work in the um, Hartford, Connecticut area right now, uh, has a slide in his training. I don't know if this is his quote. His name's Joe Brummer. It might be somebody else's quote, but he says, children need our love the most when we think they deserve it the least. It's important to keep in mind. Um, and then Thich Nhat Hanh um, really sums it up. When you plant lettuce, 
If it does not grow well, you don't blame the lettuce. You look into the reasons it's not doing well. It may need fertilizer or more water or less sun, but you never blame the lettuce. Um, I've got a list of resources here you can look into. I've got a lot more um, if anyone wants to get in touch with me. But this um, will support sort of the importance of what we've been talking about. And, and I want to thank you for spending this very brief hour getting a basic understanding of what really is a very exciting uh, paradigm shift. I've included um, some resources I've used in my own journey to understand restorative justice and specifically some of the resources I've used in developing this webinar um, as well as others that I would recommend you to use to look at to further your own understanding. Thank you very much. And thank you. Bye-bye now. <laughs>